Jesus loves even me. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, well, let's go ahead and take our Bibles this morning and let's go to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter number two. You don't know where the book of Jonah is. If you can find the major prophets, you got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, then you have the book of Daniel. And then after that, you get what's called the minor prophets, starting with Hosea. And then you'll have Amos and uh, our Joel. Uh, I, th- I had this down and, I, and now I've blown it. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Okay? Now, Jonah is probably one of the most well known of the minor prophets because of what happens to him. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Jonah chapter number two. Now, many of us have heard of John Newton. He was a rough seaman who was involved in the slave trade during the 1700s. However, after nearly dying multiple times, he gave his life to Jesus Christ and was born again. And he spent the rest of his days, of course, preaching the gospel while fighting uh, as an abolitionist towards the slave trade. He wrote one of the most well-known hymns, that we still sing to this day, Amazing Grace. And that's a great song as it testifies of God's grace saving and transforming uh, this man as as he does us. He was once quoted as saying this, though. He said, I am not what I might be. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I wish to be. I am not what I hope to be. But I thank God I am not what I I I once was. And I can say with the great apostle, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, today, if you've been saved, you've been born again the Bible way, you've had a time in your life when you've repented of your sin and placed faith alone in Jesus Christ, and have had that time in your life, that's a great thing. And that's the most important thing for you, is that you have your eternity situation settled, that you are right with God, that you're going to be in heaven one day. And, and that's, that's an important thing. And that's a great thing. But did you know that God isn't done working in your life? If you have had that time, God, and that, that's a great thing to have happened, but that doesn't mean that God's done. He's not done with your life. See, He wants to begin to change you and I from the inside out so that we become the people God wants us to be. We come to God as we are in salvation. He he doesn't ask us to clean ourselves up before we come to Him and bend the knee in salvation. And He forgives us of everything that we've ever done. But afterwards, that's when the real work begins. As He seeks to make us replicas of His own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I was reading the Old Testament this past week as part of our Old Testament reading challenge, and I came across the book of Jonah, of course, amongst that. And as I was reading the book, this cycle of sanctification stuck out at me, and I felt led of the Lord to address it at this hour. We're going to really look at most of the book of Jonah. It's only four short chapters. But we're going to start here in Jonah 2 just to kind of give you the, uh, the, the, the emphasis of, of what I want to talk about here today. It says in verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cry by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The death closed upon me around about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my, uh, my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, and to thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Today we're going to look at this and really the whole book in, a, in general here today as we talk about what I call the cycle of sanctification. 
You'll understand what that means a little bit more here as we go on. So let's pray and we'll get started today. Father, we thank you for this time of study. We ask that you would enlarge our understanding so we understand what you're trying to do in our hearts and our lives and how important it is to be involved in this and, and, and to be in submission to it. May you get glory out of it in Jesus' name. Amen. What does the word sanctification mean? It's all over the scriptures, whether it's the word sanctify or sanctified or sanctification. It's found all over the scripture. Now Webster defines it this way. It's the act of making holy. In an evangelical sense, the act of God's grace by which the affections of men are purified or alienated from sin in the world and exalted to a supreme love to God. The act of consecrating or of the setting apart for a sacred purpose, consecration. It's an important thing that goes on in the life of every born-again Christian. The work of sanctification in our lives is simply God's good work of changing our character, again, to be reflective, to be similar, to be aligned with His sons. Romans 8.29 is, is the key verse in all this. For whom He did foreknow... He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God here in eternity past, he, he determined that everybody who gets saved, who becomes one of his, will then go through the process of this conforming. It's, it's another, word, another way of saying sanctifying. And we're going to be conformed into the mold or the model of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking primarily about our character the person that we truly are. And that's what God's going to do. So that why he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, so that we can be usable to see other people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior as well. This is a very important thing to God. You know, on Wednesday nights, we're in a series called, I call Transformation Through Truth. I encourage you, if you haven't been here for that, try to come out to those Wednesday services. You, need, you and I need the spiritual uh, fruit of the God's Word. And I've been talking about how God changes us from the inside out. And we're going through a lot of the nuts and bolts of all of that right now as we're talking about it, because this is such a big deal to God. The Bible calls this work in us a good work God is doing. It's not a poor work. It's, it's not an unnecessary work. It's a good work. Philippians 1, six says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, notice the next two words, in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. It's a work that goes on inside of us our heart, our character. That, that, and he calls it a good work. Now this sanctification happens first and foremost, again, inside of us. God doesn't want just an outward conformity to his ways. What he wants is an inward transformation that impacts the outward. See, the Pharisees of old, the ones that were around in Jesus' day, were big on outward conformity. In other words, they, they wanted to look a certain way in the, in the eyes of man all around them. And they put on a very good show. People really thought these people were, were something else. And it was a lot of outward conforming to certain laws and, and practices that they, that they had come up with. But Jesus confronts them in Matthew chapter number 23. And, and those of you that have been here on Wednesday night, you've seen this before. But if you want to go over there, Matthew chapter 23, hold your place here in Jonah. You don't want to lose that. But go to Matthew 23. And uh, this, is, this whole chapter is really Jesus rebuking the Pharisees for multiple reasons, but he brings up uh, something that's worth noting in regards to what I'm talking about here today. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whitened sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity." What's Jesus saying here is this. You know how to make the outside look right. You know how to polish everything up and look spiritual on the outside. But he's saying your heart on the inside is not right. There's some real nasty stuff within there. And uh, he said, get the stuff on the inside cleaned up first, and the outward will kind of begin to take care of itself. That's where, that's where it starts, is the inward transformation. 
that needs to take place. Because in time, what was on the inside eventually came out, didn't it? Because it would be them that would have such hatred for Jesus that they would be part of the, engineer, part of the process of bringing him to the cross. And uh, what was really on the inside came out. Say, so why is this so important? Well, it's because what's in the heart is what's real. Not what we put on for a show, not what, not what people see. It's what God sees within here. When God was looking for a king, back in the days of, uh, of David and Saul and so forth, remember what he told Samuel? He said, don't look on the outward appearance. The Lord looketh on the heart, because the heart is the real person, what they really are. And it often, what, what's in the heart often comes out when life is under pressure. Life is under pressure. That's what comes out in a life. You know, sometimes people overcome things like addictions and, and so forth, and any sin can be addicted to. But if the heart hasn't changed, relapse will most likely happen when the pressures of life mount. See, you can, you can kind of get away from things, but if things haven't changed in here, then there, there's a good chance you'll go back to that. God wants heart-level change because heart-level change is what is the most pleasing to him, and that's what prevents us the relapse back into these types of sins. Hence, his goal of our sanctification is of the utmost importance to him. Very important to him. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, it says, For this is the will of God... Even your sanctification, that you should, it goes on, it should be the same from fornication, but that first part, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. God wants this. He wants heart level change. Because when he changes the heart, he'll change everything else about us. That even under pressures, that change will not crack. That we've become the real deal. Jonah, in our text, is in the process of being sanctified. And it's a buff, bit of a bumpy process for Mr. Jonah. So let's learn from this scenario to understand how the cycle of sanctification works in our lives too. As we see, first off, the difficulty. The difficulty. If you're not familiar with the story of Jonah, God calls Jonah, a prophet there in northern Israel, to go to the capital city of Assyria. Assyria would be today in northern Iraq, kind of in that area of the world. And that uh, capital city was a place called Nineveh. Nineveh. Now, the, the Assyrians historically were not very nice people. They were a very wretched, merciless group of people. They, were, they, they did some horrendous things to their enemies. I, I, I can't even begin to talk about them from the pulpit here today. I, I mean, they were just that... Uh, treacherous of a group. And they were often causing problems for Israel, especially the northern kingdom there. Now Jonah, he was a good Jew. He, he was no doubt a very real patriot. He loved his nation. And the idea that God would have him go to Nineveh to preach unto them was not something Jonah wanted to do. And we learn in chapter 4 why. Because God, he didn't want God showing the Ninevites any mercy at all. He wanted them judged. He wanted them hung. Whatever happened, he wanted it done to them. Because the Assyrians had been very nasty to the Jews. So what does he do when he gets the call? He runs as far away from God's will as he could. Look at Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amatai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Tarshish was the furthest known point in the world at that time. From, from Jerusalem, at least, or from Israel. From the presence of the Lord, notice. He was fleeing unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, which is down uh, by today the city of Tel Aviv, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish unto the, from the presence of the Lord. It's interesting how it's noted here in verse 3 that Jonah, when he's running, he was trying to flee God's presence, wasn't he? He was trying to get away from God. 
God told him to do this. He goes in the exact opposite direction, as far away as he could go. And he's always going, you, you notice here, the reference of going down. And that happens a few more times here. He's always going down. Whenever you and I run from the presence of God, we are, we are on the pathway going down, down, down. <laughs> if I can, I can get my bass voice there going. Down. Interestingly enough, too, trying to run from God's presence is an impossibility. It's an impossibility. I'm going to just get away from there. I'm going to get away from church. I'm going to get away from here. I'm going to hide in my house. I'm going to go, I'm going to move halfway across the country. I'm going to move somewhere around the world. Guess what? You cannot escape the presence of God no matter where you're at. You can hide in your closet. You can hide in your bathroom or in your basement or, in, or somewhere else. But God is there as, vi as viable as he is right now here in the church house. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? These are rhetorical questions. He's like, I'm everywhere. You're, you and I can't run from God. Now, we, we think we can escape his presence, but his presence is everywhere. David wrote in Psalm 139, verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? In other words, again, rhetorical questions. You can't. You can't. It doesn't matter where you go, where you flee, what you try to avoid. God is always there. And Jonah thought he could get away from God. And he was going to go to the furthest place that he could to do that. The whole point I'm driving at is that we cannot escape the presence of God. Now, Jonah had been a good prophet. He actually prophesied for the nation of Israel, and, and it, it turned out very good for them. It, you can read that in the Kings, in the book of the Kings. But now Jonah's on the run, and God, in his mercy, doesn't let him escape. But what is he going to do? He's going to send some difficulty into Jonah's life to start getting Jonah's attention. That's what verse 4 goes on. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. They're out there on the ship, I'm sure it's not like Carnival Cruise Line out there by any means, but I mean he's on the ship and they're they're heading out, and I'm sure I'm sure it was a nice send off, whatever it was, but now they're in the middle of the Mediterranean somewhere, and all of a sudden this great wind happens into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. You know I've watched. Um, video footage of, of people who take ships from the southern tip of South America to go to Antarctica. And uh, I'd love to do this someday, if God will let me to go to Antarctica. I'd go anywhere if I could. And uh, that would be one place I think would be cool to step on, on Antarctic uh, land, if you will. But I, I saw the ship, and it kind of did give me a little bit of a second uh, uh, <laughs> reconsideration there. Is, is it can get pretty rough with the seas because of the way the currents are down there. And, and, and I, I've seen, of course, video footage of those who, who work in the Bering Strait up in the north there between uh, Alaska and Russia. And, and those seas get really rough. And, and the, the waves come sweeping over and things like that. And that's kind of what I imagine here with uh, Jonah and these mariners on this ship that uh, things were looking a little bit rough. And, and the, their, their ship appeared to be in a position where it could break apart at any moments. You know, it's sad that Jonah's running put other people at risk. See, when we get crossways with God, we are hurting other people that are around us. Don't ever forget that. I think a lot of people think that, I'm living my life, I'm making my choices, I can do whatever I want. Uh, your life is not an island any more than mine. And the decisions you make and I make that are against the Lord have a direct impact on our families and around our friends and around those that are in our circle of influence. Big time. Romans 14, 7 says, For none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. Jonah put these mariners' life in danger because of his disobedience to God. And that is a very sobering thing to consider today. That... Uh, if we decide that we're going to run from God and do whatever we want and live any way we want, well, it doesn't affect anybody else. It affects a lot more people. You never take people, you never just take yourself down. You always take more with you. Especially, and the bigger circle of influence you have and I have, 
the more accountable we are to make sure that we are not leading people astray. I mean, it's, it, that's what's happening here. I mean, those mariners would not have been placed in that position if Jonah wasn't on board. Again, it's, it's sad that every time Jonah's running, put these people at risk, and, and our lives impact the lives of others, and can be negatively if we're not doing right. Our wrong choices always have an impact on others. They always will, one way or another. We have to remember, life isn't all about you any more than it's any more all about me. You know, you could be discouraging people today for living for the Lord by, by some actions, inactions. I, I'm, trust me, God does hold these things accountable to us. God cares about the way we behave, whether it's seen or unseen. And uh, here you see these Here's Jonah. He's on the run. He knows what he's supposed to do, but he thinks he's going to just get away, and all of a sudden he's putting people in harm's way. Now, God did show mercy to these mariners, but they had to throw Jonah overboard. Remember? And they had to cast him into the sea. And I won't get into that whole uh, situation there, but we see when they do that, verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Interestingly enough, that, that storm humbled those mariners and they came to worship the Lord. And again, that's a whole other study. But notice here that Jonah wasn't quite ready yet to respond to God. So God decided, okay, the storm didn't quite do it. Let's try this. And he had prepared... This big fish, whether it's a fish or a whale, I'm not here to debate that. It was just a very large sea creature that's could, that could swallow Jonah whole. Didn't have to chew him. He just gobbled him and he went right down the throat, into the belly. And it was there for three days and three nights. So what you have here is that God has started with a storm, but now he's turning up the heat because Jonah isn't responding. And now he's in this whale's belly. And it's not a fun place to be. Look at verse 5 of Jonah 2. He's praying, and we get a little bit of a description of what he's been experiencing the last three days and nights. The waters come past me about, even to the soul. In other words, he was in water liquid in the belly, and it was Coming, I imagine there are times it went above his head and came down. You know, he was at the what we would call uh, waterboarding, maybe, <laughs> where it was like he, he was about to lose his breath and then it would come down. Even to the soul, the the death closed me about round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. In other words, by this time, all the weeds and stuff that the whale or the fish had swallowed were wrapping around his body. You know, that's kind of gross, isn't it? You ever had seaweed or algae get on you? It's like, it's just kind of slimy. It just sticks there. And yeah. Um, yeah, that's, not, that's a little gross. He said, He went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. You got to understand that this fish was swimming. And it'd go down and it'd go up and go around and around. You ever been on one of those roller coasters, you know? And you're like, just get me off this thing. (laughs) (laughs) It's like up and down. Could you imagine that for three days and three nights and not able to get off that ride? I hope he didn't have um, motion sickness. You know, if he didn't, he he probably inherited it at this point. (laughs) I mean, this is miserable. This is miserable. See, when God is doing a work in us, sometimes he allows difficulties to hit our lives that we cannot solve on our own. Because he's trying to get our attention. These difficulties eventually do get our attention. And they reveal to us our weakness, our helplessness. But they engineer something very important to God. And that is humility. Humility. 
because they knock us down to our knees. Just like Jonah here, as we see, secondly, the deflating. Jonah thought that he, when he ran from God's presence, that he would be out of the woods and God would leave him alone. But if you're one of his, God's not going to leave you alone because he loves you and I too much to just let us go off on our way. He's going to do everything that he can to bring us back under his will. Jonah thought he was out of the woods, though, but now he's in the belly of a fish. I'm sure he didn't expect that a few days prior when he was sitting there on the coast of Joppa ready to get on that board. I'm sure he thought his plans were perfectly perfectly orchestrated. Everything's figured out. He didn't expect to be here, but now he's here. And it's doing something in Jonah's life, isn't it? He's, he's a lot different person here in the belly of the fish. He's humbled. By chapter 2, he's pretty humble. And I, I think you can read that pretty easily in the chapter when he's crying for the reason of his afflictions. And he's, and he's asking God, and he's, he's going through everything he's been through, and he said, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. All of a sudden, he's, he's not so high and mighty anymore. He's not, he's not the man who thinks he's in charge. He begins to realize, I need help. <laughs> and he begins to cry out to God. And he, and he says, verse 9, But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Very humbling circumstance isn't it? He's deflated. He's no longer fighting God. He's no longer fighting God's will. He's no longer running thinking he can escape God. He's humble and very submissive right at this moment in time. You know, difficulties have a way of deflating our ego. Oh, it will deflate our ego real quick. It will pull down our pride. It will knock down our resilience. It will break our will. Break our will. And God often has to break us down before he can build us up. And remember, this is all the good work that he's doing in us. Just like he's doing in Jonah. Now Jonah could have avoided all this just by obeying and doing what's right, but Jonah had some things in his life that needed to be dealt with. And God allowed Jonah to make his decisions but it brought about some bad repercussions. That's why he's in the belly of the fish. So, he's letting Jonah learn. Learn through these outside pressures that are breaking down things within him, just like they do to us. So that, we ad- so that areas that we wouldn't naturally change or address begin to change and get addressed. Or even reveal the blind spots that we have that we didn't realize were there. Before God uses us the way he desires, he often has to break down problematic areas until he gets our will willing to conform to his will. That's really, that's all it's coming down to, is us, like Jonah, being willing to say, Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do. And there isn't this, there isn't this, bickering and arguing and just do and having a bunch of self-will but from the heart being willing to do what God wants and God knows when we want his will versus our own self-will and God will bring us through difficulty after difficulty after difficulty after difficulty as long as it takes till that will conforms and John, if I could if I can avoid the belly of the fish I want to do that because God's got a fish for you. Not literally. Well, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Be careful if you go on cruises. Amen. <laughs> but I'm just saying this. He knows how to work in the life to get us conform to him. Go to 2 Timothy. Hold your place here in Jonah. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Paul explains this well in, in, uh, to Timothy here in this chapter about God's sanctification process, it's not meant to destroy us, it's meant to be able to 
build us so that he can use us. 2 Timothy 2.19, it says here, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, and the Lord knoweth him that are, them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In other words, God doesn't want us living in sin after salvation. And he knows his own, okay? But in a great house, a life, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, in other words, there's good things, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. In other words, some undesirable things. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, that word, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. In other words, God has to change some things in our lives to make us usable for his good. And that will require the purging out or the removal of certain things in our life that would otherwise hinder that from taking place. God's will for Jonah was to go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't like that will, so Jonah did his will and brought him pretty low in life. And sometimes that's where we have to go before we start saying, okay, Lord, I guess my will doesn't work. It's your will that I'm after. And if you're his, if you're truly saved, he will be doing this in your life. He will. He will. He will. Why? Because he knows you that who you are, you're his. And he wants to use you and I. But he can't use us if there are some things that are hindering us or some sins that we are grappled to or some ways in which we've lived in the past that do not please him. You know, he's got to change that stuff. And sometimes it's through the, the pressures of difficulties that we begin that stuff begins to break down and we begin to perform to his will. Again, that's where Jonah was. God let Jonah's own sinful choices catch up with him as a means of deflating his pride, just like he does us. Just like he does us. But it brought about a very good thing. By the time the process was all complete, Jonah here in chapter 2, is he's... He's in bad shape. He's in the belly of the whale. Life stinks right now. But he's humbled. He's deflated. And he begins to pray. As we see, thirdly, the deliverance. Again, it took three days and three nights for Jonah to, to irk out this prayer in chapter 2 before the Lord. And he cried for the reason of his affliction, it says here. And he was confident that God heard him. And this humble prayer brought about something he desired. And that was deliverance. Because of verse 10, And the Lord spake unto the fish. And it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. That would have been kind of an interesting thing to see. But anyway, all of a sudden, whoosh, man comes flying out. Looks a little, little rough, <laughs> to say the least. Could probably stand to have a shower or two and whatnot. But here, here's Jonah now. He's, he's gotten his deliverance because he finally humbled himself. God's work of sanctification is very important for our lives, and he'll work till he gets the product that he's looking for in you and in I. He will work. And when that product is finally produced, that's when deliverance comes. That's when victory is, is gained. Blessings, or whatever. That's when that's found. See, Jonah finally came to the point where he was like, okay, Lord, not my will, but thine. And uh, so God, again, in chapter 3, gives him the call. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Notice, the command has not changed. Has it? God didn't change anything in the command. <laughs> and sometimes we've got to remember that too. God's not going to change. He's not going to change what he says. He's like, no, he, what he's going to change is you and I to conform us to what he wants. Now we can fight and bicker at that all that want, but there's a whale out there. There's a whale of difficulty out there that wants to, that will come your way. How do you know that? Because I've been in the belly of the whale. Again, I don't preach anything I have not experienced personally. The, the, this is what happens. He, 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 the, the command had not changed. However, this time, 
verse 3, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. Wouldn't that would have been easier the first time? <laughs> Sometimes we've got to say that to ourselves. I guess it would have been easier to do the right thing the first time. <laughs> so he did. And uh, according to the word of the Lord, and it says that Nineveh was a great city of three days' journey. And I don't believe it's talking about it was three days from where it was. I, I think it talks about the size of the city. It was quite large. We know that it had at least 120,000 people within it. I think there, and certainly there was more than that. But uh, he began to, he, he went there and preached. Sometimes people ask God to take away certain things or change certain situations in their lives, and they struggle to understand why God hasn't. And maybe it would be good exercise to ask the, ourselves the question, why, why not? Why hasn't God changed this, that, or the other thing? Now, sometimes what happens when deliverance hasn't come, whatever form that takes, you know what people start doing is they start accusing God. God doesn't love me. God doesn't work. The promises of God, God's word, they don't work. I gotta figure this out all on my own. I gotta go figure, I gotta go do this. God's not, God's not gonna help. I'm not even gonna bother praying anymore. I'm not gonna be faithful to him, I'm not gonna do all those things. They 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 start racking accusations against God. But the more we rack accusations against God, that's gonna lead us down some really dark roads of bad choices. Real dark roads, problematic roads that you don't want to be on. Because whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You, you and I sow bad choices, we are going to get bad consequences. And every time we sow, the more we sow, or uh, we often sow, what we sow, we reap more of. In other words, we, we sow, we reap more than we sow. What we, we thought was just a small thing brought about large factions of repercussions we didn't see coming. You've got to be careful in your decisions. This is very important to avoid <laughs> problems and get the deliverance we're talking about. Really, that accusation, God doesn't love me, is, or God's not interested in helping me, or God's doing it wrong, you know what that's saying is that there's something wrong with God and not me. Right? What it's saying is, there's something wrong with you, God. You, you, you haven't figured it out. You're, you should be doing what I think that you should be doing right now. You're wrong, God. There's nothing wrong with me. When really, it needs to, the question needs to be flipped around at us. Lord, what's wrong with me? What are you trying to get my attention on? Maybe we even know. But maybe we need to ask the question. Remember, Ezekiel 18.29 says, Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. This, is, this was Israel saying, God, you're not equal. You're not doing right. You're wrong. And God says, O house of Israel, are not my ways equal and are, are not your ways unequal. In other words, Israel was accusing God of not being fair. And God said, no, I'm fair. You're not fair. He turned it around on them. Hey, if we start, it's very arrogant for us to say, God, there's a problem with you. No, there's a problem with us that needs to be changed, that needs to be dealt with with us. Don't, don't accuse God of, of uh, not loving you. He loved you because he went to the cross and died for your sins and went through such horrendous torture in order for that to take place. The problem is not God. The problem is us. The problem was with Jonah. Jonah needed an attitude adjustment. And God did it. And deliverance came after God got the product he wanted in the life of Jonah. And this product is simply this, a humble, submissive heart to his will, not our own. That's what it is. That's the product he's looking for in your life and mine. A humble, submissive heart to his will and not our own. You know why? Because that was Jesus' attitude. How did Jesus respond to the Father? John 6, 38, For I came not down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And he did that. Remember, 
we are being conformed to His image, not our own. And sometimes that takes a long time to produce in some lives. But this thing of sanctification is very important to God. And we, and we can only have certain blessings and certain victories and receive deliverance only after the life has been sanctified and brought to this position. Now, if we're still in that resistance mode, <laughs> then we'll be just simply in the belly of the fish all that much longer. It's kind of our choice, you know. We don't want to be in this resistance mode. And the longer you're saved, and the longer you, you, you learn to submit to the Lord, the more you realize, yeah, it's better. God's way is perfect. My way is, is not. God wants to bring us to the end of ourselves. And when he does, we'll, we'll discover God's will was far better than our own. Because what God used Jonah to do was to preach the greatest revival in the Bible amongst the most unlikely city of the world, Nineveh. Look at verse 4 of Jonah 3. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. I'd love to go into Minneapolis and say, Forty days, God's going to judge. And everybody in Minneapolis came to God. Wouldn't that be awesome? Boy, would that change our state. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome if that happened? That's what happened here in Nineveh, of all places. Yeah, I mean, you talk about an unlikely city for a revival to hit. For, God, for the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And, the Lord, and God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way. And the Lord repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. You know, Jesus referenced this revival later on, where they all came to the Lord in, in Luke eleven thirty two, 32, where he mentions the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. They turned to they turned to the Lord here, and they got right. And I was saying one day there'll be there'll be judgment, and they'll be uh, amongst those that judge. In other words, amongst the saved, they're in heaven one day. The greatest revival in the scriptures, right here, didn't even take place in Israel, in a heathen land. And God let Jonah be part of it. May I say, God let Jonah. Everything God lets us do is a privilege. We need to start seeing service as a privilege. And not a burden. Oh, I've got to do that. I've got to do this for the Lord. I've got to go do this, that, whatever. You know what? You and I have the privilege to serve the greatest king in the universe. Let's not forget what we've got. He, he is a great God to serve. I encourage you to serve him as much as you possibly can for his glory and honor. But we see here that Jonah had deliverance. He was delivered when he finally humbled himself. And that sanctified process kicked in. But we see fourthly and finally what I call the displeased. Now we think, we would think that Jonah would have learned his lesson, but God has to do some remedial training. And chapter 4 is all about that. I'm going to read it real quick because I'm about out of time here today, but this is after the revival takes place. This is after everything. You think, well, Jonah would be like, wow, look what God did. I cannot believe this. Why, the privilege that I got to be here and preach this great revival. Man, what an honor. Was he like that? No. No. Because there's still a problem with Jonah, and that was Jonah. Some people are their own worst enemy. <laughs> and Jonah was. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah wanted them judged. 
And God wanted to show mercy, and he was afraid if, if he started breaching the Lord to them, that they would turn. And that's exactly what did happen, but that made him upset. And again, Jonah had a problem with it was Jonah. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to live than to die. You know, some people get so stubborn that they will rather die than give up their will. That was Jonah. He's so stubborn. Difficult. But God's gracious. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? <laughs> you know, God doesn't ram at him. He just, is this the right thing, Jonah? You being right? Are you right here? Now he's going to go through a little lesson here. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from the grief, from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Bad attitude, man. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the... For the which thou hast not labored, neither madest to grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. In other words, there was 120,000 young children. And he was showing mercy on that city. See, God will send us through the cycle of sanctification as many times as we need to produce the product that he's looking to be produced. And Jonah had to go through some remedial training. We don't learn it the first time, we'll just go through it again, and go through it again, and go through it again, until the product is produced. Now, Jonah wasn't disobedient per se, but he was lacking something else in his life, and that was great compassion. It's very obvious what you see here. Now, he had... He had he had reason to be bitter because of the way the Ninevites had been. But God was looking to show mercy. And, uh, and uh, Jonah, Jonah still had some heart issues that needed to be addressed. The whole point is this. God is working in our lives for his good and our well-being. If you're, you're saved, that's what he's doing. And sometimes that requires difficulties to rear up to address problems, areas of our lives and humble us so that our hearts are willing to conform to his will. And when that comes, that's when deliverance comes. That's when victory comes. And sometimes that, that uh, the process will even expose other areas that need correction that we didn't even see before either. And sometimes we will just have to go through some remedial training to remind us that the place that we are supposed to be is centered, focused on His will and His alone. Our best response when the difficulties of life hit is simply to learn to humble ourselves and submit to Him as soon as possible. If you want to say, what shortens the cycle? That's it right there. Humble ourselves before the Lord, submit to what He wants, and then follow through with whatever obedience He tells us to do. That's simply it. It's the cycle of sanctification because he wants us to be meet for his use. Today, are you going through some difficulties or there's some things that God's trying to get your attention on? Maybe it's time to submit, humble ourselves like Jonah. Maybe you're in the belly of a fish right now, so to say, with life. Humble yourself, submit, and do what God has told you to do or, or, is, or whatnot. It's the way out because God, know, God will keep us in that belly as long as it takes in order to change us into the person he wants us to be. May God help us in whatever part that we need to do in this situation. Let's take a few moments to stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a word of invitation this morning. Are there some situations, difficulties where you feel like Jonah? I mean, you're, you're stuck. You can't really change much. It's like it's hard. 
And maybe God's just trying to get your attention like He was Jonah. Maybe there's some things that He's looking to change in your life and in mine. If God has spoke to your heart today and you'd like to spend some time in prayer, I encourage you to do that. The altar is open for you. If you want to stay at their chair, whatever works for you. But, but God is looking to do some good things in your life and in mine. He's looking to remove things that are displeasing to Him. And in Jonah's life, this story is about Nineveh but it, and the victories that Nineveh received. But before Ni the Ninevites had their revival, God had to do a work in his, pers in his, his man's life, Jonah. He had to do a work there to change him and mold him into the person that God wants him to be so that God can use him. In fact, this process happens also in the mariner's life and in the lives of the people in Nineveh. I mean, it's the same process, but it brought them to salvation. And sometimes God uh, uh, works in the life of an individual to show them their need of salvation. I mentioned John Newton in the opening there, and he got, he, he, God uh, used his mother early on in his life to sow the word of God in salvation, but it would be years before Mr. Newton would get saved, and eventually God broke that will down and brought him to salvation. And maybe that's your need today, that you need to be saved. And God's been working in your life, sending situations and circumstances and difficulties to get your attention so that you come to know him as Savior. If that's your need today, there's somebody down here front to be glad to take you aside and show you from God's word how to be saved the Bible way. Difficulties aren't without purpose. They're, usually, they're part of the sanctification process oftentimes in our lives. The best thing we can do is just humble ourselves before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness and, and, and bow to his will. His will is the most important thing to do. Are we, are we surrendered tonight? Have we surrendered ourselves in whatever area it is? Or maybe you're not sure what it is. It would be good just to ask the Lord about it. Say, what, what is it, Lord, that you need to change in me? May God help us tonight as we go through this cycle that we would do right. Father, we thank you for this morning, this time of study in thy word, to give us an understanding of what you're doing often in our lives as God's people. And, and Lord, I pray that uh, you'd use it to use these, uh, this understanding to help us navigate and, and to help us understand so that we can properly humble ourselves, submit to your will, and uh, be content with that and be obedient to whatever it is that you'd have us to do. May you get the glory today out of what... Uh, was said here, and may you strengthen your people to do right. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning and patiently uh, listening. As I, I did go a little longer than normal, but uh, anyways, just a, a quick announcements. Again, we have the ladies' luncheon sign-up sheet out in the hallway. Again, it's a soup and salad potluck, so if you are planning to come, please sign up and let us know what you're able to bring. And uh, we do have the Spiritual Encouragement Conference cards uh, stuffed in our church invitation track, so please take some if you can and uh, start inviting folks out for that. Tonight we're going to continue our series, Fighting Fear. I've been enjoying uh, uh, preaching through this once again, as uh, fear is a very uh, debilitating emotion that, that controls virtually everything we do, but sometimes it controls us too much in a wrong area. And uh, we're learning from God's Word how to get victory over that. And I encourage you to be back here tonight for, for the next message in this series as uh, we continue to dive into that subject. You know, why don't you come and just close with a word of prayer here tonight, if you could. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for, for this morning, Lord, just the, the reminder of the work that you're, you're looking to do in our lives. Lord, thank you that you do, you do want a relationship with each one of us, and, and Lord, you... You uh, 